John, you and I got to talking about when's the best time to take Social Security. And it turns out that we disagree. In my heart of hearts, I think you should wait until you're 70 and get the big payout. You, on the other hand, advocate taking it 62. Let's talk. I'm Bridget Sullivan Ramel. I've got a fee-only financial planning practice in Chicago, Illinois. And I'm John Shear. I've got a fee-only financial planning practice in Middleton, Wisconsin. And before we dig into the when to claim Social Security issue, I want to remind all of our subscribers, all, all of you to viewers to subscribe, turn the viewers into subscribers. So, hey, if you hit subscribe, it helps other people find this, keeps you up to date on what we're doing here at Friends Talk Financial Planning. And with that, I'm looking forward, Bridget, to telling you why you're wrong about waiting on Social Security. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just go through what what's your process like. So you're working uh, either on your own or uh, with your clients. Uh, how do you tell me how you, how you walk through this? Yeah, yeah. No, as as people approach the their retirement age or or specifically what's the time so when they can claim Social Security. What's that? What what age do you start thinking about this? Well, it it sort of depends on the situation. Right. So if somebody is working at 67, I'm not, we're not going to talk about Social Security claiming quite yet when they start to approach the, the time when they when they are thinking in the next two or three years, hey, I'm going to either going to retire. Maybe I retired when I'm 60 and now I'm looking to claim at 62 or at 67 or sometime where you say, listen, what's our plan? So sometime a couple of years before, I guess to answer your question, a couple of years before we think we're going to claim Social Security or we're, we're going to make a decision to not claim Social Security. Uh, is when we start taking a look and 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 running our analysis, and and I think like you do, we we use a third party consultant who used to work for the Social Security Administration for thirty years and does consulting work for folks like us. So we have him come in and run a full breakdown of what are all the options, what are the pros and cons, what are the facts, so that clients can then make a decision based on what they want to do. Right. So that's sort of the approach is once we get, once we start getting close and it's, you know, it's sort of different for everybody, but a couple of years before we think we might want to do this, we want to know what the choices are so we can make a decision. What, what, how do you guys approach it? Well, generally around age 60, uh, when one of the clients gets around 60, you know, if it's a couple and they're different ages, uh, when one gets around 60, then we start talking about it because I think people kind of want to know. And we, again, use the same consultant and uh, they do a thorough analysis. And, you know, it's interesting that um, I was talking to somebody recently who's not an advisor and I said, we hired out and they're like, what, how could that possibly be worth it? Huh. And it's, it's a brain, it's a head scratcher, isn't it? Right. Because it is for us. Uh, because the person over the breadth of our clients comes up with enough different strategies that we would have never known about uh, that it's worth it. Yeah. Well, I, I, I find that surprising too, that yeah. I mean, social security is one of the few very large, right? Uh, you know, there's a lot of dollars involved when you take a look at a 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 year retirement. Uh, and once you make a choice, you can't undo that choice largely. There's a few caveats, but pretty much, you know, it's a one and done deal. You have to make a good decision that lives it. They have to, that you have to live with. I think it's worth having the backup. I don't understand that other side of it. Yeah. Yeah. Most people don't, I, I think you have a, a period of time to stop and start and get it and not get it, but and most people don't do that. And right. the, the, you know, you're working with a government agent, a beleaguered government agent, a beleaguered, unfunded, underfunded government agency that really, they make mistakes. And so just like dealing with the IRS, you, I would say, uh, if you can limit the number of interactions you have with them, you limit the number of mistakes that can be made that are that you have to try to follow up and get them to be back in your favor. I mean, they're both of these organizations, I would say, in general, try not to make mistakes and try to be fair. Uh, but I'd rather really not spend my time wrangling with them. So yeah, 
Yeah. And I, I know, I think you've had a similar experience that uh, Denny, the consultant we use, he's, he's come up with uh, results that were different. I mean, he's, he's solved some problems that we didn't even know we had in some cases. And so I think it's worth having some that experience, you know, so. Yeah. 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 And the other thing is that stand, the standard advice I was used to be giving people uh, because of inflation has sort of changed. And so it's worth, again, just taking a look at it, making sure my assumptions are still the same. And um, I, I find it um, very helpful. So basically what we do is have uh, him lay out our options and then just talk it through with clients because I would say he's, uh, I'm a social security nerd and it helps people to have a little bit, like somebody, like we sit in and help them process the information and yep. figure out a plan. Yeah. And I guess that's largely what we do also, right? As you sit down and go, and, and, and it comes down to, I think, uh, you know, for you and I personally, probably we've got different opinions or feelings or just the biases towards, Hey, how we look at things. Right. And I, I just, it's uh, my feeling overall is it's not a right or wrong thing. It's, well, here are the choices, right? And then to make that choice. And, and for me, it's more so I like that earlier claiming idea. That's probably what we're going to do personally, but I'll tell clients like, listen, here, here's the trade-offs on things, right? And, and, and just sort of big picture without even getting into the details. The earlier you claim social security, the less dollars you get as a monthly payment, right? But you get it for more years before, you know, potentially, right? That's the early side. The longer you wait, the higher the payout goes, but you've got to pay for those first four or six or eight years and before you get up, right? You, so you don't have money coming in for eight years if you do, if you claim at 70, whereas you do have that money coming in for eight years if you claim at 62, right? It, which one's right? Well, I don't, there's no, neither one of them is right. The, I'll tell you, the actuary is talking about the, the government employees. The actuaries have it figured out. They don't, Social Security doesn't care when you take it. Right on the big picture, it's exactly the same to them whether you take it at 62 or 67 or 70 because of how the longevity, how the actuaries work on those things. Right. So it doesn't make any difference. My per one of the things I do think is really important and does make a difference, right? The government agency has to account for everybody. Right. That means the people that have the best health care available in America, the people that don't have any health care, high socioeconomic, low socioeconomic, the people, right, you know, every walk of life. Uh, but us individually, right, we, I, don't, I mean, we have very different uh, life experiences, life expectancies, uh, lifestyles than the average, right? right. And so that's the one thing I uh, I was just having a discussion actually with a journalist and talking about like when to claim and and what we've had a client where uh, and they were talking about the longevity side of things that's what they've been hearing about and uh, you know here's the trade offs and she says nobody in my family has ever lived past age eighty why would I why do I care about you know my the the maxing my out my retirement income into my nineties like that is just not a real reality for me probably you go great let's claim early. Or on the flip side, all my grandparents lived into their past age 95. Geez, maybe you've got a little different viewpoint uh, than somebody else, right? Yeah. And then, so that's something you know that the actuaries who are looking at broad, right. broad statistics don't know is what's your health. That's right. right. And so if you think your health is better than average, the average person, or geez, I just had a major health incident. Yeah. Uh, you know, though, so that that I think really plays in because you absolutely you now you have a better. I think people underestimate how long they'll probably live. However, you know if you've got a health a health history item, you know, right? And uh, just a few things that I wanted to add to what you said: if you're still working and making a, a significant number amount of money, say maybe over thirty five or fifty thousand, I don't know exactly what the number is right now. You have to wait until you're 67. That, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So, but, so we're, but uh, we just did an episode about how the average age of retirement is 62. So right. if you're not working, or if you are, uh, if you're, you're, you're not working and your spouse passed away, I think you can take it at 60. Who knew? Yeah. Okay. But again, those are the details that I don't necessarily keep in my head. Uh, you can look yet. them up, right? Right. You can look them up, and that's why we have a consultant that helps us uh, make sure we cover it on a basis. So, um, 
I, I want to mention that. The other thing is that I think for people that are waiting to take social security, I don't want people who have the means to be scrimping and saving and not enjoying, like if you retire at 67 and then wait until you're 70 and have plenty of money, I want you to be spending a consistent amount and not spend, not think I'll spend more when I have social security. Okay. Yeah. Now that takes a specific type of person. That yeah. is not a uh, spending down your investments in early retirement is not what Not most natural. people feel like doing, you right. know, <laughs> right. they feel like I want to not spend this money down. I want to make sure I still have it later. So I think that having that real, being realistic with yourself is uh, really part of taking it later. Yeah. Like, yeah, knowing, hey, this isn't like Social Security, like how much I get in Social Security is not going to impact how much I spend. Hmm. That's uh, not everybody, not everybody could say that. No, that that's for sure. And, and, you know, we were talking a little bit, or at least I was talking about some of the facts. Hey, what's the longevity? What are the things that I know? Health, other things like that. But then the feelings part comes into it too. Exactly what you're saying is what's your personality? If it's really, really important to you to have guaranteed income, which social security is, it's indexed for inflation, right? And having that idea of having as much as I can guaranteed coming in for as long as I live, if that's valuable to you, well, geez, then waiting as long as you can, because I mean, there's no arguing the numbers are higher that you're going to have more money in your eighties and nineties on a guaranteed basis, right? If that's valuable, that's not a fact. That's not a map, but it's like that fits for your situation. And for other people where they say, you know what? I'm not worried if I have less money when I'm 92, that doesn't bother me. I want to know to your point, I want to have that cash flow coming in now. So I feel like I can spend it when I'm 62 or 64 or 68. That's a different thing, right? It's not all necessarily about what does the math say? There's some of that for sure. But then there's also like, how do you feel about this? And what are the trade-offs? Geez, I'd like to have that money when I'm 64 or 65. And I know that I'm going to have less if I live till I'm 98, but I can live with that. Okay. Or until I'm 88, right? Okay. On the flip side, right? I mean, it's just it's just these choices and knowing what those are and uh, and being able to make a decision as opposed to looking at one side. There's more money when you say when if you wait till you're 70. Factually true, but that doesn't do the feeling. Or you know, on the other side, hey, I get my money earlier. Yeah, but you also give up some things, right? Know what your choices are so you can make an intelligent decision for you. I think another thing I just want to mention is that a lot of couples split the difference. So whoever, a, a common strategy that uh, we end up using is whoever is going to get a lesser amount of social security takes it at yep. 60 or 67. And then the other person who's going to get a greater amount waits until they're 70. And that helps with some longevity issues too, because if you're married and you die, whoever has a higher social security you get either your spouse's social security or your social security whichever is greater right so right. that helps again uh with some of the math and uh, you don't have to be both doing the same thing yeah yeah no that's all that's great Hey, I think that's a great place to wrap things up here. Again, I'm John Shear and I run a fee only financial planning practice in Middleton, Wisconsin. And I'm Bridget Sullivan Mermel. I've got a family financial planning practice in Chicago, Illinois. Jen and I are both taking clients, but uh, if you're interested in the way we talk and the way we think about things, and you're looking for an advisor in your area, we're both members of ACP or the Alliance of Comprehensive Planners, and you can find an advisor in your area at acplanners.org. We're trying to get to a thousand subscribers. That's right. Hit that subscribe button.